It didn't take much coaxing to get the humans to agree. Even Izumi could hardly contain her excitement to get inside the equivalent to a Gundam. The hardest part was getting the boys away from the Barrier Steel Suit, named so after the company that created the very first model. The Sona gave them a little rundown on the specifics, as fresh spacesuits were being made for them using a type of superior alien 3D printer. At least as far as Jean-Francois could tell, that was the best explanation to what he was told the machines were doing. La Sona had measured and gotten all the measurements she needed before beginning her small briefing. So, we'll be doing a skirmish, brawl scenario. This means it's just a straight up fight, no objective except to be the last one standing. Weapons are tuned down so we don't actually hurt ourselves or damage the steel suits too severely. What weapons are available? Barry seemed to be taking this more seriously than anything else at the Academy up to this point. We're limited to lasers. Real games, however, also have missiles, railguns, and melee. For defenses, a Type 7 plasma shield is the primary means of protection. A second layer of armor exists, but for these skirmishes, we stop when there's an armor breach or the steel suit runs out of power. Lasona pointed out on a display the various components of the steel suit. Now, since we're not many, we'll be doing three versus three with condensed roles. Normally, a steel suit is crewed by a pilot, a shield operator, a gunner, and a spotter or comms operator. Overseeing the squadron is also a commander. Since we're free, pilot and spotter become one position, while gunner and shield operator are the other. A few questions. Jean Francois raised his hand, hoping to ask before Lasona continued on. How do we pilot these? Also, you mentioned a shield operator, so shields are manual? Lasona changed the display, showing the inside of the steel suit. When you sit down in the seat, which is also being manufactured right now, you'll connect to the steel suit in a very taxile way. These seats are easily replaceable depending on the pilot's size. Your movements will be interpreted by the helmet you'll wear and be sent as actions to the steel suit. Hence, a human pilot should be able to pilot this to Idan steel suit. But you'd have much more difficulty, if even able to, with a four-legged noir steel suit one, for example. The shields are manually controlled by an operator in order to save energy. The operator activates them where they are needed. The laser requires a continuous stream to inflict damage, so you'll need to keep it focused on the enemy. What about the tail? remarked Laura. I don't think it should cause much issue. At worst, you won't be able to use it. We can maybe remove it if it causes trouble, but it helps for balance. The Sona looked behind the humans and waved. Oh, good. They're here. The four turned around to look at whoever was approaching. A small, black, furry creature came into view, making small but quick steps that clicked on the hard metal floor. It wore some open vest and small shorts, a tiny tail swinging at the back. It also appeared to be related to the sheep family of species, if not for its elongated face that seemed canine in nature. Moving alongside it, a blue alien that could best be described as some kind of blob or rather a slime slid across the floor at the same pace. Izumi's eyes went wide as she saw the small fairy creature. Without much of a warning, she got up and ran towards it, prompting the poor thing to backtrack and run in the other direction. It didn't get far, however, as Izumi's longer legs allowed her to snatch it up. Unhand me, you foul beast! It screamed as she held it tight to her chest, muttering to herself about how cute it is. That is my friend Smuriet. He's the pilot of my team, introduced Lasona. Can you please let him go? Izumi relented and put the creature down, its cleft hooves tapping the floor, making a small clang as she lowered it. Never in my life have I ever, it raged, murmuring under his breath as it got some distance between Izumi and itself. Hello, Lasona. How are you today? asked the other creature. I'm good, thank you, Lekos. These are the new students, they're human. This is Barry, Laura Izumi, and Jean-Francois, she said, as she pointed them out for Lekos. The four of them greeted Lekos using waves or bows. All right, so lastly, the skirmish location is on the flat surface you saw outside the dome. That is the top of the Tarmina station. At random, a few metal panels will be raised, allowing for cover. Lasona closed the display and began walking towards the still suit. Now, for teams, I'll need a gunner for my team, and the other three will be able to use the backup steel suit, Avaton. I'm not going to lie, it's rather inferior to Numidium, but we're just doing this match for fun and practice. Is your friend not playing? Izumi was afraid she had scared the other alien by her show of affection. Smurit is, but not Likos. 
Her kind, the Kusi, don't do well in these kind of environments. Usually most species have certain positions they excel at for Steel Squadron, but hers simply don't use them. I'd like to try Gurner, proposed Barry. I've got a few guns back home, and I played a bunch of shooters back in the day. Well, I've been hunting a few times with my uncle. He used to work for Hecron Koch, so I've had the chance to see a few guns. I think I should be the other gunner, added Laura. Jean-Francois and Izumi nodded their understanding. Izumi was next to speak. Well, I've never gotten my driver's license, so I don't think I will be a good pilot. If you don't mind doing it, Jean-Francois? It's fine by me. I've often wondered about how far virtual reality could go, and this seems like a great moment to experience. Lucena stopped in front of Numidium, the Dwight Dunn steel suit, and smiled. After hearing their short bit of history, she really wanted to see how well they'd do in a steel suit. The machine signaled it had finished its job, and she walked over, retrieving four spacesuits for the humans. Let's suit up. In the dome, red lights flashed, indicating the beginning of a steel squadron match. Secondary dome protection procedures became active, raising another partial dome around the main one. Out on the top of the station, large metallic plates were raised from the station's structure, creating an artificial battlefield. Atop the dome, two small rooms occupy the topmost space, giving view to the full battlefield. Lusona sat in the top one, overlooking the entire station, and began readying herself for the match. As commander, she wouldn't have much to do in a skirmish like this, but in official games, she'd be analysing the situation, formulating a plan, researching enemy steel suit capabilities, and communicating with her own steel suit. The elevator dinged, signalling it had just reached her floor, and someone exited it, his heavy steps reverberating through the floor. Hello, father. A short, tired grunt was all the reply given, as her father let himself down gently onto the soft floor cushions that surrounded the small room. The stable doors opened, letting out the first steel suit, the spare one that Jean-Francois was piloting. It moved rather clumsily and without any grace. He moved to the other end of the field, taking cover as they awaited for the game's start. A few minutes later, giving time for the first team to choose a position, the Numidium stepped out, gracefully moving at a good pace with the skillful piloting of his pilot, Smuriat. I'm still surprised you managed to convince Smuriat to pilot for you. He's pretty good, remarked her father. Who are you playing against? He added, after a pause. Lasona took a deep breath. The match was about to begin. The new students, the humans. Down in the lounge area of the dome, Xenos were getting ready for some entertainment as the Steel Squadron game was about to start. Many stopped what they were doing and headed to the windows in order to better see the match. It looks like the Dwight Dunn stable having a practice match. They'll need it if they hope to make the finals this year. Yeah, their performance last year was abysmal. I'm surprised they didn't lose their funding. The Avaton looks pretty rough around the edges. New pilot, probably. Bet you five CMPC they don't even last five minutes. Ha! Huh, I'll take that bet. A high-pitched single note sound rang throughout the dome, indicating that the match was about to begin. Only one floor down from the sonar, Izumi was in a similar room to her enemy commander, able to see great distances and the entirety of the battlefield. The sonar had briefly mentioned to her that this was to simulate being in orbit and having satellite assistance, granting a bird's eye view of the full battle to the commander. Testing, testing, do you receive me? She spoke to the communication device in front of her. It was linked to a computer. Loud and clear, came the reply from Laura and Jean-Francois. Okay, match is starting. The enemy is at your nine o'clock, moving in your direction. It took a moment for Jean-Francois to situate himself, turning around to change his positioning. Getting a bit more used to the controls, he peeked behind the metallic panel and advanced as he saw no one. On the other side, moving much more fluidly, the Numidium made his way towards his target with assistance from his commander. Okay, stop. They're right on the other side of this panel. Maybe flank them? Izumi wasn't sure what they needed to do, but it sounded like the best move. Obviously, a role like commander would shine more during a bigger engagement. As her team began moving around to get on the enemy's rear, Izumi was surprised by the enemy's movement. The Numidium jumped up high, gaining height advantage on the backup steel suit. As soon as it landed next to the Avaton, the Numidium began firing his laser weapon. To John Francois's credit, he managed to react rapidly enough, dashing to the right while Laura activated the shields on the side, receiving laser fire. 
The damage was minimal, but helped put the Numidium on the offensive. It kept at it, following the Avaton while its gunner tried keeping the laser on it. A fast-paced exchange followed, lasers striking the exterior armour briefly before shields fell in place, cancelling the laser with high-density plasma. The plasma shielding used more energy than the lasers, making defensive turtling a bad idea. Jean-Francois kept his steel suit in motion, trying to make Barry work harder to get more solid hits on him. The superior manoeuvrability of the Numidium meant that Laura had to work harder than Barry in order to keep her weapons focused. Jean-Francois darted behind some cover, buying some time. Izumi gave him the Numidium's position, but there wasn't much he could do with that information because Lasona was also giving them his position. He started getting more used to the Avaton's responses, his movements becoming slightly more fluid with time as he ran around, trying to let Laura get some shots in while he focused on trying to be hard to hit. It was a mixed success. He was able to use the shields less, but Laura was missing more of her shots. Damn it, stop moving so much, Jean-Francois! Laura screamed as she switched the shields to her left arm, cancelling now the Numidian's laser ever so briefly. I can't. If I don't try and dodge some of these, we'll just run out of power. Jean-Francois was at a loss of what to do. His machine was inferior to the enemy's, and his lack of familiarity with it did not help. He thought about rushing it, maybe catching it off guard and throwing it on the ground, but remembered that melee was off the table for this skirmish. The Avaton's energy reserves depleted mere moments later, the steel suit grinding down to a halt. Disappointed, Laura and Jean-Francois waited in the steel suit as it was towed back into the hangar. Up above in the commander's post, Lusona's father stood up. Well, that was a tad bit underwhelming. He looked at the game statistics sheet as he scratched his chin. Although, the Numidium gunner had a fairly good accuracy with 82% continuous laser uptime. That's a fair bit above the league average. You should look into adding him to the roster. Her father was right. She'd have to get Barry into the team somehow. She had expected a good showing from the humans, but she was left more impressed than she initially thought. Even the gunner of the grand champion noir team, Feto, only had an accuracy of 72% without using computer-assisted targeting. And you know what? I never even told them there's computer-assisted targeting. Both gunners were simply using manual controls. She entered the elevator, leaving with a smug look on her face as her father blinked rapidly in visible disbelief. Down below, the spectators in the dome returned to their previous activities, having enjoyed the temporary entertainment. Hey, 5 minutes 28 seconds, you owe me 5 credits, she had one of the Xenos. The other rolled his eight eyes and shook his head, deciding that it had been a bad wager. Back in the hangar, the pilots exited their steel suits while removing their helmets. It had been a short time, but a rather strenuous activity. If Jean-Francois had to compare it to something human, he'd have said bumper cars and steroids. Lucena and Izumi had come down from the dome in order to meet up with the others. Ah, dang. Sorry, girls. Wish I could have been better. Jean-Francois' head hung low. Hey, that was actually a fairly good first showing, Lusona said, as she did her best smile. Yeah, it was a ton of fun, even if we wouldn't have won, added Barry. I might even have to say, this sport is even better than hockey. If we had this on Earth, I'd sure it replaced baseball as America's favourite pastime. Lusona is right. For a first time effort, that was pretty good. With some training, you could maybe make it into a lower division steel squadron league. Smirlet's kept his distance from Izumi as he joined in the conversation. You got any water around here? That was a pretty good workout and I'm parched. Jean-Francois looked around but saw only machines and tools. Lasona mentioned to everyone to follow her. Oh yeah, let me buy you all a drink. At first they were rather sceptical when she had mentioned drink, but they were pleasantly surprised when they had sat down on the second level of the dome to find an actual bar-like area. Lasona had ordered something called Citus, what she'd explained was the juice of a hard shell fruit for all of them. You know, I'm really happy there's at least juice. I don't know how long I could have gone on with just water. Jean-Francois returned to his drink, emptying it in a few quick gulps. I'm glad you like it. These ones are a bit expensive though, so maybe you don't get too used to them. They're only grown on a planet very far from here, so availability isn't very common. There are other types of juices that cost a little less. Oh yeah. How does money work for you guys? Like, does every species have their own thing, or there's some kind of universal currency? Barry had put away his drink, focusing all his attention on the Sona. It'll vary by where you find yourself. Everyone accepts a CMPC, which stands for Carbon Nanotube Plating Credit, 
but most also have their own currencies. Governments have agreed on the standard measurement for a plate of this material, whose value derives from being used in almost all space constructions of large scales due to its tensile strength. One CMPC is worth 1 35th of a plate, but we don't actually carry those around. We have digital devices that store them. So a bit like when we used to have the gold standard. How rare are these carbon nanotubes? Inquired Laura. They're not rare, they're useful. Speaking of money, however, Barry, there's something I'd like to discuss with you in private. Lasona got up, beckoning Barry to follow her. The others began making small talk as the two of them left occasionally looking at the replay of the match on the screen above their table. Well, I suppose we should find a way to earn some of those CMPC. I'm intrigued at what the exchange rate would be like for euros, wondered Jean-Francois. Uh, show me we could even make this material. Likely high, but it'll depend on what the standard measurement for a plate is, added Laura. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. One species could be willing to pay a lot for something native to Earth. The trick will be finding out more about what every species wants and likes, Izumi said as she stood up. But for today, I'm just going to go to sleep. It's been a long one. Laura and Jean-Francois waved goodbye to Izumi as she walked towards the elevator. They waited a bit, but Lasona seemed to be having a rather long conversation with Barry, who was listening and not talking. Looking at his laptop, Jean-Francois realised there were only seven odd hours left before the start of the next classes. Well, I suppose I should get going as well. The day was fun. I hope we get to do it again. He waved goodbye to Laura, heading to his room.